Hey everybody, how you doing today? My name is Alexander Miller. I hope you're enjoying the conference and that you're learning a lot. I'm going to talk today about some regulatory issues around moving data from the European Union to the United States. And there are a couple relatively unique wrinkles I'd like to emphasize. I'd really like to talk about the future of this topic, so I'm going to start by talking about the past. Some of the privacy activism in the past that got us to the present point. Some of the past attempts at figuring out the sort of right list of ingredients for people to stay out of trouble. And then just how did those things get us to where we are? And then in addition to just going over where we are now, I'm going to talk about some technological approaches to privacy that are new and emerging that I think have a lot to do to help out with this issue. Not just now, but in the future, uh, if we see things evolve as we've seen them evolve in the past. So here is the agenda for the talk. There's roughly three parts. This first part is approximately the past. How did we get here? This middle part is what is here? What is the situation right now? And then the final part is about emerging technologies that might make a big difference. Now, just a, a quick bit about me. I come originally from academic mathematics. I worked in data science a long time. How did I end up here? Uh, I saw that these technologies were out there and that they were a great fit on a lot of problems I saw out in the marketplace. And I'm out trying to tell people about them and start using them. So uh, while I think I can give you a great account of kind of the story of the rest of it, uh, I, I'm your expert if this kind of category three is of, of broader interest to you. Real quick, if you like the talk, I'm going to show some slides periodically. There's a slide deck that sort of acts as an outline for the talk. And at the end, I will show this slide again with the location of a GitHub repo where you can download the slides. So this will help you, you know, if you would like detailed notes on all the things I've said, uh, that's a quick and dirty way to get it done. Now, I hope everybody's heard of GDPR, which is currently the major data privacy regulation framework in the European Union. Really some of the headaches I want to talk about have important history that goes back at least as far as 1998. And in particular, I'm going to focus for the moment on some of these adequacy frameworks. The idea of an adequacy framework is it's a sort of laundry list of high level things you're supposed to get right. If you're in any foreign country and we're going to focus on the United States, and you're doing something with the personal data of European citizens. So once again, the idea of the adequacy framework is you do these things and you're adequate and you're not in trouble. And so, so far we've had two rounds of everybody got together and they figured out, well, what is the kind of right list of things that people should do? And then this thing got written down and adopted and it usually had a cool name. And two times now, because of the activities of privacy campaigners uh, targeting invariably Facebook, they've been struck down by European courts and people have been left without a good story about what they needed to do to be right by the law. Now, it's important to note here why it's hard. There's a good fundamental reason why it's hard and we're having these serial do-overs with the adequacy frameworks. So if anybody remembers this guy, Edward Snowden, the National Security Agency has this big surveillance program, PRISM, and it's the judgment of people in the European Union that this kind of surveillance is illegal when the topics of the surveillance are European citizens. And the question is, how can you give some kind of guarantee that data, for example, that a European citizen might put on their Facebook account doesn't somehow end up in the hands of the NSA in a way that is inappropriate relative to European law. So they have tried to do this twice now to give this kind of guarantee and twice they've decided that their old solution wasn't good enough. I want to talk real quick about just what was in these adequacy frameworks, Safe Harbor and Privacy Shield. They each had seven high level principles and I presented them a funny way here because they're really the seven same principles for both, but they got extended. And I invite all of you out in the audience out there to consider 
Does this look a little bit like a Band-Aid on a Band-Aid? It looks a little bit like that to me, and I'll talk more in a minute about maybe a good way to think about this is there are just some ugly differences between what people in Europe and the United States think is appropriate. And so it's naturally been very challenging to get these adequacy frameworks in a place where people really feel good about them long term. So to just touch on these real quick, I hope that it all looks very reasonable. So, you know, a lot of this has ended up in American laws. Notice is something I think we were all a little bit sick of a little bit ago. Uh, choice has shown up in aspects of law in California. That you retain some liability for the things that people do downstream is a part of HIPAA. Uh, security is something you would hope everybody would get right. Uh, so nothing too crazy here. What I'd really like to emphasize is that these words in parentheses are, are what got added uh, at the privacy shield phase. And it tells you just a little bit about where the pain points are that we've struggled to get this right two times now. So some of you may have heard of Schrems 1 and 2 as the legal rulings in the European Union, which struck down Privacy Shield and problematized standard contractual clauses as an approach to getting to the same place. And so, you know, hey, it must be important, right, if we're using letters instead of numbers so often to count. But Maximilian Schrems is a person, and I think the story of, of his journey uh, can tell us a lot about just the pain points that have gotten to this point. So he actually did some law school work in Southern California. And the story is that a lawyer from Facebook came by to talk about how they handle privacy. And he felt like that fellow just didn't know anything about how privacy law works in the European Union. And I think, unfortunately, it's pretty common that Americans don't have a great understanding about how these laws work even though, you know, we're often on the hook to comply with them. So that set this fellow, Max Schrems, down a road of activism, trying to challenge how Facebook used the personal data of European citizens. And uh, it was very impactful in the end. So he started out filing a complaint with the Data Protection Commission in Ireland. Uh, as some of you may know, Ireland is where a lot of American companies have their European headquarters. So it's actually the Irish government that oversees these things. And eventually, and I'll talk about this in a second, it reached the European Court of Justice uh, for the big splash that we're interested in. Just going back to this Band-Aid idea, in between Safe Harbor and Privacy Shield, there's this famous remark that you know, is this just the round trip to Luxembourg? Once again, uh, this idea that maybe we're putting Band-Aids on Band-Aids here, and there's a fundamental conflict in the law that we're just papering over for the moment. So once again, these things have been going on a long time. The earliest complaints were, I believe, beginning in 2011, and this continued through various courts and regulators all the way till 2020 when Privacy Shield was struck down. And not only was it struck down, but some serious doubts were cast over what are called standard contractual clauses, which are a clause you put in a contract to commit to doing everything the right way and tell people you're doing everything the right way. And so what does this mean? It means that the European Union doesn't presently have uh, an official story about what you're supposed to do about this Edward Snowden prison problem. Transferring data to the United States puts it in unacceptable danger, and there's no official story about <laughs> there's no official story about what you're supposed to do to make it better. So let's take a little time. You know who's in trouble here? What kinds of things get you in trouble? What are the things that you might be doing that put you in danger of being in trouble? So straight off the bat, if you're a consumer facing business and you collect any kind of information at all about the people that you're doing business with, and there's lots of obvious stuff you might want to get like their name, 
uh, an email address. All this is very useful for marketing and standard. That's exactly what the law covers is personal information about European citizens. So any kind of customer facing business where you're trying to maintain a relationship with your customers, you could run into these kind of troubles. Second, you know, the cloud is so hot right now. The cloud makes it very easy to get in trouble. Let's say I'm operating a customer relationship management business. My business is in the United States and I do my hosting in the United States, but then I want to have European customers. So via the magic of the internet is very easy from a practical standpoint, they could just go on the internet and use my app and easy peasy. But then the issue is, even if I'm very diligent about how I handle my business around my customer relationship manager, the people that use it in Europe could be putting all kinds of stuff in there without my knowledge. And I probably am not going to have a great time chasing them around, babysitting them. You know, they might have customers that they want to have relationships with, that they want to manage using my app. And those customers are European citizens and their information is getting put in my app and that data is getting sent to the United States where my hosting is and where my office and staff are. And therefore in the eyes of European regulators, now I'm, I'm contributing to putting that data in danger. And then another category is, you know, maybe you might want to do analytics on some kind of data. So a very direct example is, if I had a lot of consumer data, I'm a, I'm a European corporation. I've got a lot of consumer data I want to analyze. Or I could be a multinational corporation. I'm doing it all in-house, but just in different places. I've got staff in different places, hosting in different places. You know, if I send my consumer data to the United States to have somebody else work on it, and that makes it vulnerable to illegal surveillance, well, I might be in trouble. And... An important note here is that, you know, a lot of businesses have these and, and many others, this is not remotely an exhaustive list, have these kind of purposes all mingled together. And if we're just following the story of Max Schrems and his lawsuit, Facebook's a great prototypical example. So from the perspective of a user, Facebook is basically a cloud application I'm using maybe to you know, store my photos and my political opinions and this kind of thing. It's very much baked into the app day one. You know, you gotta give Facebook your name. You gotta give them an email address. They're getting that data. And in a way, what Facebook does for their true customers, advertisers, is they do analytics. They say, you know, there are this many people that have this interest in this community. So Facebook's inevitably using consumer personal data for a lot of things. And it should be emphasized here that if you're somebody who's using this sensitive data for a circumscribed purpose, you know, if you go back, that was one of the seven principles is that you, you should really know in advance what you're using the data for and be able to say, I'm going to use it for that and not something else. If you're in this, this happy situation where your use of the data is, is for a circumscribed purpose, you're probably okay going forward with the standard contractual clause approach. And so these, these privacy frameworks are really for companies like Facebook that are moving a lot of data wholesale, and it's integral to their business that they're using that data for a lot of different, possibly you know, rapidly evolving in time purposes. Uh, and they're not going to be able to give you a contract that says we're just going to do ABC with it and nothing else. So the uh, privacy clauses are really for this fire hose crowd that have these different purposes mingled together. All right. So where are we now? There's a few things you can do to stay out of trouble that are known. First, and what I'm going to talk about quite a bit more in the rest of the talk, is you can avoid keeping data in the clear. You can encrypt it. You can tokenize it. You can put it in some kind of condition where if it ends up in the hands of the wrong people, they won't be able to do with anything with it. And I, I think of the things on my semi-facetious list here, 
that's probably the best one and certainly the one closest to my heart. I'm told that for the right crowd, standard contractual clauses, which once again is you have some explicit agreement about you're promising you're only going to use the data for some particular purpose that's legitimate under EU law. Those are likely to be okay going forward in some form if you're not part of the Facebook data firehose crowd. So that's what people tell me. I would talk to a lawyer as Simultaneously, the, the wisdom out there is that, uh, you know, standard contractual clauses are kind of on probation right now, you might say, but it's expected that they survive in, in some form as a legitimate approach. I think a lot more people than would admit it in public are crossing their fingers and just hanging on waiting hoping that there is a new privacy framework on the way. And there are some pros and cons. I, I certainly wouldn't recommend this approach. You know, as we saw a few slides ago, at least on the level of the seven principles, from safe harbor to privacy shield, things did not change too much. So if you were doing a great job with Privacy Shield and you think maybe another framework is coming soon and it's mostly gonna be the same, it might go okay for you to hang on. But you should ask your lawyer about that one twice. And I would warn, we live in a very geopolitically turbulent time. And if there's another framework coming, the creation of that framework is going to be mixed in the sauce of all the other international uh, grievances that people are trying to work out. These things are, are typically hashed out in part by diplomats. So it's very difficult, in my opinion, to make a really hard guarantee like, oh, well, there will be another similar privacy framework in three months. Don't worry. I, I wouldn't take that route, and I would be, be very careful about getting advice about, you know, why do you think this, this passive approach is a good idea? Uh, most facetious on my list, it seems like some people are of the approach. You, you set up your headquarters usually in Ireland if you're an American company that works with a lot of data in Europe. And you send a lot of really, really scary lawyers to Ireland to tell them about all the, the horrors that may be inflicted on them if Privacy law screws up your business. I, I can't really recommend that one either. It sounds very, very expensive. Uh, but some people are at least partially kind of leaning, leaning on this approach. And it's worth noting, no one has gotten really kind of hideously punished post shrems yet. But once again, I wouldn't recommend waiting around to be the first one. All right, time for a polling question. In a second, I'm going to be quiet for about 45 seconds while the conference organizers send you this poll. I might as well remind you, I think some of you are looking to get professional education credit here. And for some of you, it will be required that you do this poll. So uh, if that's you, uh, pay attention. Uh, and here the polling question is, did Max Schrems begin filing complaints against Facebook before or after the adoption of GDPR? I'll give you 45 seconds to think about it.
All right, so now we're entering part two of the talk. I lied a tiny bit when I said there was no story from European regulators about what you're supposed to be doing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the most recent guidance, uh, I believe of just a few months ago, about what you're supposed to be doing going forward, what are the possible ways you can shore up your situation in a way that's in harmony with European law. So I wanna emphasize this is a larger document. It's not just for people in the United States, for example. There's some commonsensical things in there like figure out what your transfers are uh, that I, I'm not gonna talk about. I'm gonna focus in particular on one of the appendices to this document where they talk about possible technical fixes, things you can do like encryption. And I'm later gonna talk about some very special types of encryption, how you do them in the right way to be right by the law uh, some things you can do where maybe they think there's nothing you can do to be right by the law. Just kind of the ins and outs of what are the tea leaves here about how to do this right? Uh, once again, I'm, I'm interested in not just right now, but in the future. Okay, first, and of most interest to me, they take some care to say that if you're doing a task where you don't need data in the clear, I'll talk more about what that means, but in the clear is sort of opposed to being obscured or encrypted and that kind of thing. You're probably fine. If you look in the document, there are some guardrails about essentially concealing things well enough. You know, if you're using encryption, they would like the keys to be stored in the European Union. They want it to be some real legit encryption and not Lord knows, uh, you know, you just blanked out the first letter or, or who, who knows? There's, there's a lot of ways to do something wrong. So they have some guardrails, but essentially, if you can find a way to handle your business while you keep all the data from being easily readable uh, without some help from people in Europe, then you're okay. And what I want to talk about in part three is that technology around dealing with data that's not in the clear is moving really, really fast. It's pretty counterintuitive, but you can do an awful lot, an awful lot under this heading, I kept data out of the clear, uh, and therefore I, I'm right by this regulatory guidance. All right, next up. So you can see we jump from one to six here, and there's a number of other cases they discuss, some of them, in my judgment, slightly overlapping. I want to show an example on the other side of things where they say quite explicitly, if you are transferring data to a cloud service and that cloud service is gonna handle it in the clear, and once again, this just means, you know, when you write your name on a piece of paper that's in the clear, versus encrypted or tokenized, they can't imagine you doing anything to be be right by their rules. And there's people with lousy imaginations and they later encounter things they didn't expect. So this, I think we've seen a lot of that lately, all of us. Uh, but this is a very strongly worded document, right? Uh, don't wait around for a way for what you're doing to turn out to be legit we don't think it's ever gonna be legit. Finally, I wanted to elaborate purposefully on this phrase in the clear. I think it covers a lot of different particular approaches. And I believe this is not my industry, but if you're handling financial data, tokenization, for example, is so prevalent in some areas of that industry that that is almost the word people use for not being in the clear. So. There's a lot of different ways to not be in the clear, many of which are, I believe, are, are legitimate relative to this regulatory guidance. There is uh, tokenization, as I mentioned, just replace the offending data with a secret code referring to you know, a box in a database somewhere safe. There's all kinds of blurring and obfuscation technologies. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if we have time to list them all or if I've even heard of all of them. 
Uh, the one I'm really interested in is encryption, which is where you apply some mathematical technique to make the data useless. And then the whole point of encryption is, of course, that you have a key. Uh, but so once again, uh, in the clear is bad. There's a lot of different ways of being in the clear. They travel under different brand names. Uh, I expect that many of them satisfy the requirements of the guidance. All right, it's poll time again. First, I'm going to revisit our first question. Did Max Schrems begin filing complaints against Facebook before or after adoption of GDPR? It was quite a long time before GDPR was even in people's imaginations that this saga began. And so you can, you can go way back in time. Uh, GDPR was largely based on previous German law, so there was a lot of conflict there really going way back. And that's what motivated the original falling dominoes that got us to Schrems 1 and 2. So the correct answer is before. All right, our new question, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna handle this the same way. When we get to round three, I will uh, talk about the answer. Does current guidance from the European Data Protection Bureau permit transfer of data in the clear to cloud service providers? I will give 45 seconds for the organizers to get this question out to you officially, and a little time for you all to look at it. All right, now we're entering part three. I'm going to talk about some emerging technologies I think have tremendous transformative power for helping people both get the things done that they need to get done and comply with these sort of regulations in a thorough way. So as a preface, these are not really easy technologies to understand and I'm going to talk in a second. The names are kind of terrible. So the big splash here is that the data stays encrypted, but you can modify that encrypted data or perhaps do, do particular processes on it that allow you, in a sense, to get the work done you needed to do as you were doing before. And I'll give some very detailed uh, and what I hope you will find to be kind of basic and approachable examples of this. It's not super easy to wrap your head around at first blush. I think one helpful bit of terminology is probably a lot of you have heard this dichotomy, you know, there's encrypted data at rest, there's encrypted data in transit. All of these technologies are encrypted data in use. And once again, that sounds counterintuitive, and I'm gonna do my best to give you a lot of detail on just what it means. I'm going to talk about two big scary words, homomorphic encryption and zero knowledge proof. There are some companies out there using these words. I find them a little bit unhelpful. So I'm going to give some examples. Uh, I'm giving you these words so if you if you hear them again, you'll, you'll know that you've been exposed to them and you can be one of the cool kids who's already ahead of the curve. I'm going to go through some examples in a second and talk about why this is encrypted data in use. All right, well, let me point out a couple things and, and try to get a big idea out there. So we've been living in this world where you have to have data in the clear to do any work on it. And it's easy to kind of get into this tunnel vision. Well, I've got to see the name and the address and whatever to do X, Y, Z kind of data cleaning work on it or match it on to some other data, et cetera. It doesn't really have to be like this. So first off, just really super basic example, so much work that people do in data engineering, it really hinges on 
and there's older techniques for doing this, is this the same as that? So you could imagine I gave you some encrypted data. I gave you two encrypted names, and I could start with a basic question like, if I could decrypt this, would I get the same thing on both sides? And then I could get fancier, I could say, you know, well, if you could decrypt these two names, would they turn out to have nine out of 10 characters in common? And so what I'm talking about is exactly how can you take that encrypted data, not decrypt, but rather do some kind of other magic trick to get a yes or no answer to that question and then not have to expose the underlying data. And kind of more generally, the observation is, well, when I'm working with sensitive data, uh, you know, it's very often times one of two things is true. First, maybe I'm working with the sensitive data, but I'm not really interested in the sensitive data per se. I want some high level insight that is not sensitive. So a good, a good case here is birthday is pretty sensitive. Uh, you know, you might call your bank. Uh, they might ask you something about your birthday. It does a lot to kind of set apart who you are. Uh, let's say I'm a website. I might care if someone's over 13 for social media, over 18 for some other purposes, over 21 for marketing reasons. I might care if they were over 65. I just want to, I don't really want to know your birthday. I could get you in trouble, you could get me in trouble handling your birthday. I'd love to know, you know, just are you over the age of 13? Uh, so one, one way you can take this technology is, well, send me your encrypted birthday. I'll have it later in that encrypted form, and I'll talk about this more in case I need to do some kind of like fancy or audit on who I've got, but I can process that encrypted data. I can just answer that question. Well, is this birthday, whoever this person, does this make them over 13? Give me that answer, yes or no. I don't want to see the birthday. So that's category one. Category two. Very often I'm taking some data and I'm computing some other insight from it. And I, you know, I don't really care. Uh, it's not for me, it's for some other decision maker. You know, I worked around analytics and data science for a long time. It's very common that uh, you get a request from some other department, they want a spreadsheet with some kind of information, some kind of summary of something. Give me sales data broken down by zip code. Uh, what you can actually do with this sort of technology is you take that encrypted data and you and you produce an encrypted answer to that question and you send it to them. And if they're the right person, they can decrypt it and they can see that high level insight. Uh, they didn't have to see the underlying data and I didn't have to see anything at all. So that's, I think that's still gonna seem a little bit opaque. Uh, I'm gonna keep kind of going elaborating on this idea, but I just wanna point out here that you know, n nobody's just staring at people's names and addresses to stare at them. There's some kind of high level insight that's going to drive a business decision, and that's what you want. And the idea of how this technology can be applied in the business world is getting people, just the right people, to that high level insight without exposing much of the data to anybody along the way. Okay, check it. So here's a funny scenario. I've got just a spreadsheet of some, you know, expenses, money coming in, coming out. I just want you to do some basic arithmetic in this spreadsheet for me and check to make sure all the numbers add up right. That's something you can do, right? That's not a big deal. That's not a big deal for you to do that, right? Okay, so what if the spreadsheet looked like this? and I didn't give you uh, any of the, the clear text data. So this is the old problem of, you know, well, if the data is in, not in the clear, how am I supposed to do anything with it? So I, this is the spreadsheet I give you, I'm the boss. Uh, and I say, I, you know, I'd like to check out that these numbers add up, that the kind of ending numbers are correct. Uh, all, you know, all the computations of the spreadsheet are as they should be, uh, that I, ha I have the right headline number at the end. Could you, could you double check that arithmetic for me? Uh, great, okay, good, do it, go to, go, go to town. Um, all right, okay, I'll, I'll, see you, I'll see you at the end of the day, bye. Okay, so if you remember, I had these two big scary words. The big scary phrases were homomorphic encryption and zero knowledge proof. 
And I'm going to talk on the next few slides about what do these words mean, and then I'm going to show how if you can do these two magic tricks, you can do exactly this thing that I was unreasonably demanding of you a moment ago, do an essentially blind audit on a spreadsheet uh, with all its values encrypted, and know that you actually double checked something, but you don't actually have to learn any of the values that were in that spreadsheet. So let's start with homomorphic encryption. The idea of homomorphic encryption is Let's say I have two numbers, I encrypt them. In this example, they are, are five and seven. So now I have two strings of gobbledygook. You know, if I handed them to somebody else, they wouldn't know they were five and seven. That's the whole point. I've got a special algorithm that I'm going to call addition, or I'm going to call multiplication. And I put my two numbers into my addition algorithm. I get a new piece of gobbledygook ciphertext. And the idea is that when I decrypt that new ciphertext, uh, I'm going to get the answer of 5 plus 7, which in this case is 12. So this is this idea. I could encrypt some data, and I send that data to another encrypted person. And if I know how to do this homomorphic encryption trick, they can add and subtract and multiply and divide numbers. Uh, using that encrypted data, uh, they're going to put the encrypted inputs in, and they're going to get the right encrypted answer out. So they did work for me. They're doing computations. They're crunching numbers. They just don't get to see what comes out at the end. But they know it's the right thing relative to what they put in. So uh, homomorphic is this idea. You're just preserving the structure. Uh, you know, whatever that new piece of uh, ciphertext encrypted data is, it's the right thing uh, relative to what this, the original plain text was, even if I, I don't have to know what that original plain text was. Uh, so there's a lot of potential here, obviously, if I had somebody else I wanted to crunch numbers for me, but I didn't trust them or my government didn't trust their government. I can give them this encrypted data and they can still do the work. Everything is blind on their side. When I get the answer back, it's encrypted. I own the key. I can decrypt it. So I've hugely increased my privacy, but I've maintained my ability to outsource that number crunching work to that other party that I might have some privacy concerns about. All right, next up is this idea of zero knowledge proof. This area has some funny conventions. We're imagining somebody named Peggy is trying to prove something uh, to somebody named Victor. Victor, the V is verifier, prover verifier. The idea is Peggy wants to claim she has some particular piece of information. Uh, she wants to prove it to Victor, but she doesn't want to share the information. So right here, I'll stop. Maybe the privacy benefits of this are pretty obvious, right? I, I've been called on to demonstrate I have some piece of data. Uh, I'm somehow going to prove it to you that I have it without showing it to you. So this, a, this is a little counterintuitive. I'm going to go through the kind of standard basic example in just a second. An example of this that you might see using your life every day and not really think about is a digital signature. So digital signature lives in the world of public, private key, cryptography. Public, you give it to anybody so they can send you messages. Private is special. It lets you decrypt the messages people send you. A digital signature is exactly a zero knowledge proof. I am proving to you that I have a private key that goes with a particular public key, but I obviously don't want to show you my private key. Otherwise, this key pair is ruined. Uh, so this is a great example of a zero knowledge proof that it's probably inside your browser even now, I imagine. Uh, and, and it shows up all the time and we just don't, don't call it this, but it's actually a great motivating example. All right, so now just for fun, I'm gonna go through this very standard kind of cartoon example of a zero knowledge proof. We're gonna imagine that there is a donut shaped cave with a magic door in the back. And Peggy claims she's got a special magic key that opens the magic door. And she doesn't 
want to show Victor how it works or give him the key, but she wants to prove that she's got it. And she's going to prove that she's got it. And this is how a lot of these things actually work under the hood. She's going to prove she's got it by doing something repeatedly that she could only do if she had the key. And so in particular, she's going to go into the cave by one route or another. Victor, the verifier, is going to call onto the cave, come out by the left side or come out by the right side. If Peggy has the key, it's no big deal for her to open that door and come out by the side, Victor requests. And if she doesn't, she's going to get it wrong a lot. It's going to be pretty obvious pretty quickly. So she could get lucky once or twice, and Victor's got to decide uh, what level of confidence he wants. But if Peggy can keep performing this trick, well, then she's probably got that magic key. And she successfully showed to Victor uh, she has this ability that comes from the magic key. She must have the magic key. She's maintained her privacy about just what that magic key is and how it works. Uh, and in you know, our examples we're interested in, the magic keys we're probably talking about are consumer personal data and uh, sensitive intellectual property and this kind of thing. All right, let me revisit my unreasonable imaginary workplace ask. So one aspect of what I asked you to do was to add up the numbers that had been added up in the spreadsheet. And this is exactly homomorphic encryption. Uh, if I'm okay with getting an encrypted answer at the end, homomorphic encryption is you take two encrypted numbers, you add them, and you get a new encrypted something that if you could decrypt it would be the right answer for adding those two numbers. And at the end, I asked you to verify uh, this specific ending funds number. Well, I had that encrypted value that I got from homomorphic encryption of all the numbers uh, added and subtracted. And then uh, a zero knowledge proof is exactly, well, I want to check that that is the same as this particular value, but I don't want to learn anything. I don't have to learn about what it is. So for example, maybe if it's not the same value, I don't need to learn what it is. I just go back to you. Uh, I guess properly you go come back to me in this example and you say, well, you know, given the privacy tech, I, it's uh, there's a problem with the spreadsheet, but you know, I, I wasn't permitted to know what it is or where the discrepancy was. Uh, and the punchline here is I've maintained total privacy around what was in the data, uh, but I can still f perform this very basic silly audit of making sure all the numbers are added up correctly. So these are kind of, you know, two kind of hot new terms for edgy technology. I hope I've done a decent job of explaining to you in general, like what, what do these words mean? Uh, and then the punchline here is I can combine these two techniques to do uh, this basic audit without actually having to see any of the underlying data. So I, I think that's I think that's a pretty cool trick. Uh, and it's very general. You can do just about anything uh, that you could do on clear text data. You know, of course, at the end, whatever is actually revealed in clear text for a business process. Uh, is still subject to all the privacy rules, but you can do an awful lot to protect data earlier in the pipeline and keep it private. Uh, and that's what makes me really excited about these technologies. And, you know, just to return to the regulatory stuff again, these kind of technologies, you know, you, you can do an awful lot of work uh, without having any data in the clear. You could use a technology like homomorphic encryption, you encrypt the data in Europe, you send it to the United States. People in the United States do all kinds of computations on it for one purpose and another, including just maybe on the back end of a software tool, coming up with new encrypted values that they are not able to view, uh, sending that data, encrypted data, after those computations back to Europe where they uniquely hold the keys, 
Uh, and this could all be handled by software. And this is, you know, this has been achieved and I could show you examples. Uh, in Europe, you're just using that software tool. It's actually 100% uh, blacked out in the United States what that data is. Uh, so you, you've hugely expanded with this technology uh, what sorts of tasks fall under that use case one I showed you about tasks which do not require data in the clear. Yeah, and finally, I just want to close. Uh, I talked to a lot of people about this technology. I, I know it sounds a little science fictional. I always want to emphasize it's it's new, but it's it's not that new anymore. So, in two thousand nine, uh, a fellow named Craig Gentry made a big breakthrough in just how how to do this. He, it was his PhD thesis, his academic research. He predicted at, oh, and so he won a MacArthur Genius Grant. So if you don't trust me about who's smart, uh, the Genius Grant people agreed that this fellow was smart. He's widely interviewed at the time, and he said, well, you know, I think it, it'll take about 10 years to catch on. So that'll get you to roughly 2020. Uh, and I think for 2021, this broader area, I think they used to term like privacy enhanced computation, is one of Gardner's uh, top 10 trends for the year. Uh, so it's new, but this is a technology that exists that you can access now, and uh, the party's just starting, so don't be late. Okay, and before we get into questions, we'll revisit our, our last poll question. I have the final poll question, and we can talk about the answer to the poll question at the end of the question period. So. Our previous poll question was, does current guidance from the EDPB permit transfer of data in the clear to cloud service providers? The answer is no. Uh, it's pretty strongly worded. They tell you they can't imagine a way that you could do this uh, under the current state of the art that would be okay. Uh, so it's a fairly emphatic no. Our next question, do you need to decrypt encrypted data to verify that a computation performed using that data was done correctly? And we'll revisit the answers after the question and answer period. And here, finally, I'm going to leave you with this promise slide. You can visit our public GitHub repo, which is full of talk slides and get the slides for this talk which I've been showing you if you were interested in the content and you'd like to read the text more carefully. If you're interested in getting in touch with me, I've enclosed my email address. Uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn and I, I share this kind of content all the time, although LinkedIn will only let you talk for 10 minutes at a time. So feel free to connect with me there. Uh, I also have a Twitter account. I, I used to communicate with people about these topics. I, I use it very little, but if you tried to contact me on Twitter, I'd eventually get to it. So uh, I'd love to hear from you one way or another, and I really hope you enjoyed this presentation.